Okay, let's check out page four. How fast can college students read? A recent report indicates that the average reading speed of most adults is around 200 words per minute. College students move that pace up a notch because they practice reading more often. Based on a random sample of 24 college students, a 98% confidence interval for the corresponding population mean reading speed was reported as 225 words per minute to 375 words per minute. You may assume the necessary assumptions are met for the intervals and tests presented and the question to be valid. <clears throat> so when we look through this problem, we know that we're dealing with a confidence interval for one population mean. So our parameter of interest is mu. And here we have our specific population of interest working with college students. That gives us that 98% interval from 225 to 375. So let's jump into the first question. Determine the appropriate words and value needed to correctly complete the following statement. We estimate the average distance of the possible blank for repeated samples of 24 such college students from the blank to be about blank words per minute. So again, we're dealing with this average distance and we're trying to figure out whether we're talking about the standard deviation, standard error, it's one of those. Well, we have our keyword here of estimate, which should already be leading us into that direction of standard error. We know it's an estimated average distance. And now we think, well, what is the distance from what? What is varying from what? Well, we know for repeated samples of size 24, with each new sample, we're going to get a different sample mean, x bar. And we want to know how all of these x bars, all of these sample means, would vary from the true population mean, that fixed parameter mu. So what we're going for here is the term for the standard error. So let's fill in the blanks first for the words. So we know the possible sample mean values because again these will change from sample to sample. So all of our x bars and how these would vary from the true population mean. That one fixed parameter, mu. Well, now that we know we're dealing with the standard error, we have to go ahead and calculate this value. So, if we kind of think about our interval here, we have 225 to 375, and we need to find the standard error. In order to do that, we simply have to deconstruct this interval. The first step in that is finding the margin of error. We need to figure out the half width of our interval, because we know each confidence interval is made up of two margins of error. So to find the half width, we'll simply take 375 minus 225 and divide by 2. This gives us a value of 75. So now we know that our margin of error is equal to 75. But what does our margin of error equal? So let's head to the formula card really quick. So if we look on the formula card under one population mean, we have our equation for the confidence interval. We have our midpoint, the sample statistic, x bar. And then we add and subtract that margin of error from that value. So we know our margin of error is everything after that plus and minus. So let's go back and calculate that. So we know this 75 is equal to, as the formula card had, t star times the standard error of x bar, which is what we're interested in. So the last step here is to find t star. So let's head back to the formula card. So we head to our t table to find our t star multiplier. We first need to figure out our degrees of freedom. The sample size we have for this problem is 24. And for one population mean, the degrees of freedom is simply equal to the sample size minus 1. So we'll be dealing with row 23 here. From there, we want our desired confidence level which we know from the problem background is 98%. So we head on down the table 
to see where these two meet, and we get our T star multiplier of 2.5. So now we can head back to the exam, and now we have 75 is equal to 2.5 times that standard error value that we're after. Doing some math, we should get a value of 30 for the standard error. And that's simply what we're going to add to that final missing blank. So we can see here, in order to calculate that standard error, we simply had to deconstruct the interval they gave us. First, find the margin of error, which is the half width of that interval. Then find the T star multiplier that we used to create that confidence interval to figure out how many standard errors fit in that margin of error. OK, so moving along to part B, we have to decide if each statement is appropriate or not appropriate. Statement 1. If we repeated this sampling procedure many times, and for each repetition we computed the 98% confidence interval, we would expect 98% of the resulting intervals to contain the population mean reading speed for all college students between 225 words per minute and 375 words per minute. So when we read through this, the beginning of this statement we know because we're repeating this many times, they're going for the interpretation of a confidence level. If we keep reading, they talk about computing the 98% confidence interval for each repetition, which is great, and they say that they would expect 98% of these intervals that they've created to contain mu, the population mean. So up until this point, this is a great interpretation for a confidence level. The problem arises in the second half of the, or the very end of the statement, when they list the specific interval, 225 to 375. We know that because we're creating a confidence level, or talking about a confidence level, each new interval we create from sample to sample is going to vary. It won't be at the exact same spot. So we don't want to list a specific interval when interpreting a confidence level. So this statement is not appropriate. For the second statement, it says, we can be confident that 95% of all college students will read at a speed between 225 words per minute and 375 words per minute. So it says 95% of all students will read between these two values. Here again, we have to remember what interpretation they're going for. Here it's a confidence interval. When we're talking about an interval, we've created this range of values to try and predict our parameter, the population mean reading speed. Here, this is more so talking about 95% of individual speeds being between this range of 225 to 375. But we want to try and capture the interval in which our parameter of interest will fall. So this one is also not appropriate. Instead, we would want to say that we are 95% confident that the population mean reading speed falls inside of that interval. Finally, question C. How fast can 8th graders read? Based on a large random sample of 8th graders, so we have a new population of interest here, the report provided the following information. The 95% confidence interval for the population mean reading speed by all 8th graders was reported to be 115 to 185. The p-value for testing the hypotheses mu is equal to 183 versus mu is not equal to 183 was reported to be 0 0.0732. Which of these intervals could be the corresponding 90% confidence interval for the population mean reading speed for all 8th graders using the same data? So when we work through this problem, we know a few things have to be true. First, since all we're doing is changing the confidence level of our interval, it has to be centered around the same value. So our 90% interval must have the same midpoint. So we come up to our original interval to calculate the midpoint, 115 
plus 185 divided by 2 gives us a midpoint of 150. So now we have to see which of our intervals has that same midpoint. And I'm going to label these intervals 1, 2, 3, and 4 so I can reference those. If you add 105 to 195 divided by 2, you would get a midpoint of 150. So interval 1 checks out. Interval 2, if I add 125 to 165 divided by 2, I would get a midpoint of 145. So we can already eliminate interval 2 because it doesn't share the same midpoint. If we check the final two remaining intervals, 3 and 4, those both have an interval of 150. So we can't eliminate those just yet. The other thing we know to be true is that in changing our confidence level from 95 to 90, the new interval must be narrower. Here we are using a smaller multiplier, so we're going to get a smaller, narrower interval. So in examining the intervals, intervals 3 and 4 do get narrower. We move our lower bound from 115 to values of 120 and 116, so that's narrower, and we move our upper bound 185 inward to 180 and 184. But if we examine interval 1, our lower bound gets further away from our midpoint and our upper bound also gets further away from our midpoint. So we have a wider interval there. The final thing that we can check to figure out whether we're using interval 3 or 4 is using this additional piece of information they give us with the p-value and this additional hypothesis test. So they want to test whether the value of mu is equal to 183 or if it's not equal to 183 and they give us a p-value of 0.07. So we know if we're creating a 90% confidence interval, that would be equivalent to a hypothesis test run with a 10% significance level. At a 10% significance level, with a p-value of 0 0.0732, we would reject H naught at a 10% significance level. So we know because we would reject the null hypothesis, the value of 183 should not be in our interval. So now we just examine the remaining two confidence intervals. We see that interval 4 does contain that value of 183, which is what we don't want. So we're left with our final answer of interval 3, one that does contain, does not contain, sorry, that value of 183. So here, it was a tough problem, but we really had to think about all three aspects here. It had to share the same midpoint as our original interval. It should be narrower than our original interval. And we then use that additional information from the p-value that we should reject the null hypothesis, and thus that value of 183 should not be in the final interval that we have.